Hello, I'm Hans Bezemer. I've been a programmer for 40 years and I'm using Ford. Ford is a deceivingly simple language that is notoriously hard to master, but it enables me to make more complex programs and faster than I ever could in C. In this series I'm breaking down some of the most intriguing projects I took upon me. And today we're gonna see if a computer can program itself. If you've seen my previous back and forth video, you might be left with the impression that the Ford stack is automatically always in the order you need. And I can tell you from experience, that is not the case. Let's say you want to subtract 3 from 7, but the elements are in the reverse order. How do you fix that? Well, fortunately Ford comes with a number of words that allow you to duplicate elements and put them in the right order. In this case we would need swap. That simply reverses the order of the first two elements. Note that for the remainder of this video, the top of the stack, abbreviated as TAS, is on the right hand side while the bottom of the stack is on the left hand side. If the top of the stack is occupied by a redundant element, we can simply get rid of it by issuing drop. If we need a copy of the element below the top of the stack, we have over at our disposal. DAP duplicates an element as well, only this time it's the top of the stack itself. And finally ROT takes a third element of the stack and rotates it to the top of the stack. But there's more. Remember we have a return stack. That's a system stack where all the returns addresses are stored. But until the return instruction is executed at the very end of our macro, uh sorry, definition, let's clean up our act. You can do pretty much anything you want with it. However, if you make a mistake and there's some random value lingering on the return stack when you hit return, this value will be treated as a return address and anything will happen and usually not very good things. So take care when using these. The 2R word takes the top of the stacks and places it on the return stack. The rfetch word duplicates the top of the return stack to the top of the stack. Note nothing actually changes on the return stack. The rfrom word takes the top of the return stack and places it on the top of the stack. There are other words as well, but these are the most basic ones. And note you can express most of those other words by combining the words we listed here. Now, Finding the correct combination of these text manipulation to achieve the specific order you need may be quite an ordeal, especially for newbies. We've already seen that there's no word that allows you to go deeper than three stack elements. And note that when you duplicate stuff, the first two elements that were so easy to reach at first are now one level deeper. And a word like time and date doesn't really help. That one leaves a whopping six elements on the stack. First the date and then the time. Let's say we don't need the date. That's easy. We could define a word like tree drop that simply does drop drop drop. But let's say we need to preserve all time related elements and we need to make a copy of it like tree dub. How the heck are we going to do that? Well the easiest way is to let the computer figure that out. We've got eight different stack manipulators. So let's try them all. But most probably one word is not going to do it. So let's try every possible combination of these eight words. Note that for every word there are eight combinations. But maybe we need three words, so we need to try all these combinations as well. Or maybe we need four words. You're probably catching my drift now. Of course we must never overflow or underflow any of the stacks. If that happens there's no need to further investigate these paths, since the program would have resulted in an error. That happens when we try to fetch a word from the return stack at the very beginning. 
even if the return stack were occupied, it would be a very bad idea to mess with the return addresses. And there's another drawback as well. When we need only one word, we have to consider 8 possibilities, or 8 to the power of 1. When two words are required, we need to consider 64 possibilities, or 8 squared. With three words, that number has risen to 8 cubed, or 512 possibilities. With four words, we're looking at 4096 possibilities. That's an exponential growth. That means that when we're considering a word requiring 9 stack manipulations, we got to consider over 150 million combinations. And that number will increase eightfold with every word we add. That's a long wait. Now I built that one and it served me quite well. It doesn't break any sweat up to 7 words, but the last two may take a minute. But it isn't very intelligent. It will even consider a combination of endless swaps, although that obviously goes nowhere. But is there another solution? I've always been fascinated by genetic algorithms. As far as I'm concerned, it's the best proof for evolution. In its simplest form, the algorithm is required to reconstruct the scent that me thinks it is like a weasel from absolute gibberish. It takes the best candidates from a population of hundreds or even thousands of similar gibberish sentences, makes copies of them and then applies a number of random changes and repeats the procedure. Now, no matter how long it takes, no matter how you calculate its fitness, it always comes up with the proper solution. So could we use this algorithm to come up with a sequence of stack and manipulations that fit our objective? I found it pretty intriguing, since in the me thinks it is like a weasel problem, I already know the solution. I simply watch it stumbling to watch that solution generation by generation. But here I don't know the solution. It has to come up with it by itself. So could this work? Or would all my programming be in vain? I created a small fork machine. With a stack, a return stack, and a small dictionary containing all eight primitives and the word it had to produce. And another one. And another one. And a whole lot more. I fed them with a single word and put the elements on the stack. And then let them run. And then I scored them. For every correct element, counting from the bottom of the stack, I gave him 3 points. For every element too many or too few on the data stack, I subtracted 1 point. For every element on the return stack, I subtracted another point. If a stack error occurred, I subtracted a point as well. And then I scored all those machines. I also created a limited number of survivor rooms. If a machine had the highest score, it would be placed into one of the survivor rooms. Of course, since the number of survivor rooms was limited, it was possible there would not be rooms for all of them. On the other hand, not all survivor rooms had to be occupied. All those machines with a lesser score would be filled with a word from the random survivor room. The one with the best scores would be untouched. The final stage was to modify the words. I created four simple mutations. The first one simply dropped the last word. The second added a random word. The third replaced a random word with another random word. And the final one simply truncated the word at a random place. Yes, you can come up with fancier modifications, but I decided to keep it simple since there was a really good chance that all my good work would amount to nothing. The point is, genetic algorithms are very easy to implement, but extremely hard to comprehend or predict. If it would render no results, it would be virtually impossible to see where I exactly went wrong. The fun part of this algorithm is, every run is different. It may come up with a solution, or exactly nothing. It may be a very efficient solution, a solution you can reasonably optimize, 
or something only a complete newbie would consider to be a success. The first version needed half a million generations to come up with a solution for a 3DAP, but that one contained a bug. Fixing it resulted in the thing doing absolutely nothing. Changing the algorithm slightly restored its functionality for some reason. I finally settled for an 80% mutation rate using only three of the four mutation algorithms, dropping to 20 once a viable solution was found. Because it's much more fun to have a suboptimal solution than to have all your solution wiped out by an overly aggressive mutation algorithm. Now you have a 1 in 5 chance that it produces a solution to the tree dub problem within 10,000 generations. On my machine running, scoring and mutating a thousand generations of 256 tiny Ford machines takes about a second. So a complete run takes about 10 seconds. Is that faster than a brute force method? Certainly not. And the brute force method always produces the most optimal solution, because all other possible solutions have been tried and failed. So from a usability point of view it's... Uh, let's say limited. But it's a lot of fun, both making and running it. Sometimes it comes up with more than 10 valid but weird solutions in a single run. And as far as I'm concerned, that's what it's all about. I'm Hans Bezemer and this was another episode of Back and Forth. <laughs>